Hello Edinburgh, uh, my name is Peter, I'm a developer from Copenhagen and uh, I have spent a long time of my career thinking about performance and about tooling and uh, for the last two years I've thought primarily about fonts and this talk is some of the highlights of what I've learned. 70% of all websites use web fonts or at least the ones that we have statistics of. Um, they do so for very good reason. There is brand consistency, legibility, or even just being sure that the user actually experiences what you designed. Um, so chances are you're probably using web fonts in the audience, um, but the problem is using a web font has an implication on the user experience. So when we're talking about user experience implications of fonts, we're talking about two different uh, metrics. The metrics that come uh, at the earliest of the loading timeline, uh, one is the first paint, which answers the question to the user, is this happening at all? Is my page loading? Uh, and the second one is the first meaningful paint, which answers the question, is it useful to me? And one could argue that text is quite helpful in determining whether a page is useful to you. Um, so the problem here is that web fonts actually slow things down. And I'm going to show you by example. So we'll start out with Hello World. It's an awesome website. Uh, this might become a startup one day. Uh, the code is quite simple. If you're a web developer, you've seen this before. It's a basic scaffold. It says hello world. Um, so now I add a web font. And I go to Google Fonts, and I choose the font Tangerine. And I add it to my web page like so. This is what Google Font uh, recommends. Um, so I copy and paste the snippet that will inject a style sheet on my page. I use Tangerine in my, in my style.css. And now I have a different heading. So let's all share a user experience of the difference between system fonts and web fonts using Google fonts. On the left, you have the system fonts. And on the right hand side, you have the Google fonts. And you will notice that the font looks nice on the right hand side. You might also notice that it takes four seconds more to actually load the page. Now, these measurements are done under slightly bad conditions uh, to your standards probably. Uh, this measurement is taken on a Moto 4G mobile phone and on a slow 3G connection. In the UK you would call this a bad day. Um, in emerging markets this might be above average. So if you want to actually serve a nice experience to people on not so good network connections you need to think about this. If we look at, yeah, so let's take a look at why, why this is so slow. Luckily, Saray already introduced you to the network waterfall charts. I have a lot of these in my slide deck, so I'll walk you slowly through them. Uh, on the top, you see the system fonts. You can see that up here, uh, the HTML is loading. That takes a long time because it needs to establish a connection. Then it loads the CSS. With the Google fonts, it does the same thing, but then it also needs to load a CSS from the Google font server. And suddenly you see a very, very slow connection time here because this needs to establish a connection to a new server. And then it loads the font, which also establishes a connection to a new server. Most of this time is spent on waiting on idle network because of the high latency of the connection. So the reason that this is all slow is threefold. One is that CSS loads are render blocking. So you could see that the page doesn't actually render. Rendering is the green line here. That's the first paint. Uh, the page isn't rendering before the CSS has actually downloaded. And secondly, the, the font download only starts when the page is rendered because the browser needs to construct a render tree and figure out which fonts actually apply to which text. And third, new connections are extremely expensive, especially on high latency connections. So this is the user experience again. At four seconds you have the first paint and then at six seconds you have the font. And in between you have a flash of invisible text. And you might have noticed this, especially on mobile phone connections, if you're on, in non-ideal environments. So this is about loading fonts faster. And the concept is quite simple. We need to move this point up here where the font is loaded and move it up there before the CSS is loaded. And then we have our fonts in the first paint. Sounds very easy, but the rest of the talk is about doing that. So the first thing we need to do is take control over the way we load the fonts. Uh, 
And I'm using Google Fonts in this example, and for good reason. Uh, it's an external service, uh, which means that the new connections are slowing you down. Google Fonts is not special in that sense. They're not better or worse than any of the other external services. They perform about the same. But what's nice about Google Fonts is that all the fonts have a very liberal license, which allow you to download them and self-host the fonts. And there exists uh, a tool. The text is quite small. It's called Google Web Font Helper. You can go in there. You can type in the fonts that you know you're using. It will give you a CSS snippet that will link to the files, which you can also get in a zip file, and download those. I copy-pasted that snippet into our Hello World page, uh, which now links to my local hosted fonts. And let's look at the difference here. So the Google Fonts experience is on top, and the self-hosted fonts is at the bottom. And you can see a very clear difference in loading time. We've reduced the loading time by uh, a few seconds, three seconds-ish. That's a big deal. Uh, and this is all because we're not connecting to external hosts. So this is an HTTP2 connection. So it's already reusing the heated up connection that, uh, that established uh, the connection for the HTML. But we can still see this critical request chain where the font doesn't actually start downloading until the CSS has loaded and rendered. And there's this gap, and we can do something about that. So there's a technique called preloading, and Sari already uh, introduced the concept of hinting. Preload is one of these hints for the browser. You can basically tell the browser, you might not know this yet, but I know you're going to need a file in just a second, so please start downloading it, and then eventually you'll see why. So what you do is you add a, a link real preload, uh, you point at the font, I'm pointing only at the WOF2 version of the font because it turns out that preload support is a subset of WOF2 support. And if a, if a browser has the choice between multiple formats, it'll choose, choose WOF2 over what else is available. Um, this gives you a 70% global coverage uh, of browsers that will support this. So 70% of all browsers will start preloading this font immediately and save you time. But we can actually do better than that. There's a thing called the CSS uh, font loading API, and we can use that to kick off preloading with JavaScript. I have a snippet down here. I'll share the slides later so you can uh, see the details and know what to look up. This adds another 15% global coverage for browsers. So we're at 85, 87%-ish uh, support globally. This is quite good for, for this low amount of code to add to your page. Let's look at how that improves the performance. So we can see in the middle here, we have the self-hosted fonts from before. And at the bottom, we have self-hosted fonts with preloading enabled. And you can see that immediately as the HTML is downloaded, the fonts start loading. But you can also see a different thing. The first paint with self-hosted fonts came at 2.5 seconds, but now it comes at 3 seconds. What's happening is that the font with a high download priority is now clobbering the bandwidth and disabling the ability to load the CSS quickly. And there's something we can do about that. The next thing that's going to happen now is that we're moving from the easy stuff to the hard stuff. So what we've covered now, self-hosting your fonts and preloading, that's like the 20% of work that gives you the 80% benefit. Now we're going to flip that around. I'm going to do 80% work to get the last 20. So your takeaways, if you're not listening to any of, of the rest, preload and self-host. <laughs> Subsetting is a way of reducing the size of a font to contain only the glyphs that we might need. This is essentially says, why download things that, that we might not need? It's downright rude to do that uh, to people who pay for bandwidth. So Google already does this. Um, Google does subsetting by creating a heuristic that says, these characters are, are more likely to, to um, show up together. So Google says Cyrillic characters is one group, Greek characters is one group, Latin is another. There are more groups. Each of them have a different file, and the browser is instructed which file contains which characters by Unicode range. The trouble with this is that it's not wide enough supported in all browsers, and the fallback is quite horrible. Either the first font or the last font declared will be downloaded, and that might not be what you need. Um, so, the, so even Google Fund recognizes this, and they do a server-side detection of your browser and delivers this style sheet only if it determines the, uh, the browser is capable of doing this. 
I'm not a big fan of this because it requires a server-side component that reduces my options of hosting. I prefer static hosting and I prefer solutions that work for all browsers. So I'm interested in a different technique called aggressive subsetting. This is the act of determining exactly which characters you need from which font variant and creating fonts that only contain the characters you actually use. Now, this has previously been considered an anti-pattern. Uh, this is an article by Bram Stein, one, on, one of the world leading uh, web font experts. He literally wrote the book on web fonts. Um, and here he argues that uh, aggressive subsetting is dangerous because it's actually quite hard to know which characters you're using for a font and which specific font variation. And what you see as a result of you forgetting one is what we've already seen in Nico's talk you might be missing a glyph and you might get artifacts like these and suddenly your website looks like a ransom letter and nobody's, <laughs> nobody's really interested in that. But if there was a way where you, where you could fall back from a missing glyph and actually load the missing stuff, then this would turn from an anti-pattern to a pattern. And I came up with a technique, or I don't know if I came up with it, but I haven't seen it in the wild yet, which I so far call graceful superset fallback not a catchy name. If anybody has a better idea, please come up and say so. The idea here is to create two different fonts to give them different names and actually use the subset font before the actual original font. This means that the browser will start off downloading the, the Tangerine subset and if all glyphs in the subset are the ones that are needed on the page, everything is good. It doesn't download the original font. But if a glyph is missing, it'll kick off the download of the original font and you still have all your glyphs available so you can render them. So this means that loading the subset will be smaller and faster and you'll get a, a quick immediate rendering and if dynamic stuff comes in later that you hadn't anticipated, you'll still be able to support that. The hardest thing here is knowing which characters you need. And luckily Zach Leatherman, another world leading web font expert, has created a tool called Glyph Hanger. It will load up your page, it'll in inspect it, it'll do get computed style, figure out which characters are you using, and then automatically create a data structure that describes which web font needs exactly which characters. It can also automatically create these subsets for you, which you can then subsequently uh, inject into your page. So let's have a look at what that does to the performance. So on top you can see the, where we left off, the self-hosted preloaded fonts, and on the bottom, you can see the self-hosted preloaded subsets with the techniques I just described. And the difference is quite massive. This is like another half second, uh, 600 milliseconds off the, the page load of the time to first meaningful paint. So now the meaningful paint and the first paint are actually identical. And this reduces the total load time of the first meaningful paint by 20%, which is quite impressive because, as you can see, the first two seconds we cannot control at all. That's just downloading the HTML. So obviously, obviously not everybody writes only Hello World. You might have more text on your page, you might have more font variants, and you might have uh, fonts that are big enough still that they take longer to load and that they kick in uh, after your CSS is loaded, which means that you still might need to deal with this uh, flash of invisible text. Luckily, you can instruct the browser how to deal with that. So the default is making the text invisible, but you can uh, instruct it using the font display property to render immediately or render in a different way. I highly recommend looking, uh, taking a look at Monica Dinkulescu's talk about this. She goes really into depth about how the rendering pipeline works and there is really good stuff in here for optimizing your font loads. So this is the list of things that we could do to optimize our font loading perfectly. You can self-host your Google font, uh, which puts you on par with, with, uh, with self-hosting. Um, you can create font subsets, which reduces the payload. You can preload those subsets and put in a polyfill to get wider support. You can use the graceful superset fallback to make sure that you're not missing any glyphs in the, in the final rendering and you can use font display swap. So anytime I look at, at a list like this as a lazy developer, as a tooling developer, I think, I don't want to do this. Well, not every time at least. Some of these are easy, like the preloading is, is one thing that you need to add to your page. But the perfect subsetting, the aggressive subsetting, is something that you potentially need to do anytime the content of your page changes. 
I don't want to do that. It's very error prone and nothing good can come of it. So we need robots. And I have spent the last one and a half years working on such a robot that can do that for you. I call the project Subfont. It is available on NPM. And the way you use it is that you, you run a binary, you point it at an entry point of your website. Uh, in this case, it's Hello World Google Fonts, which is the example where I just added Google Fonts. It did nothing else. And then I tell it dash I to please replace the content. This means don't do it on your raw files, do it on your build output. And then I tell it to inline the CSS. Um, this means also that there has to be an actual HTML page with actual content. So I can do a static analysis. But let's have a comparison of all of these different stages we've been through. On the left, you have the system fonts, then Google fonts, self-hosted, self-hosted, preloaded. And the last one here is Google fonts, so pane number two, but with soft font applied. I did nothing else than, than apply my tool. And what's interesting to see is that the timing actually competes with system fonts and not with any of the other preloading techniques. Now, 2.6 is looks faster than system fonts. I can tell you that is not possible. That is a network glitch during a measurement. This is uh, measured using webpagetest.org. But I literally haven't seen a technique that can get you faster font loading than this. So it's really, really good. Obviously, not everybody does Hello World. Uh, this is my blog, a real world page. Uh, it's extremely simple. There's not a lot of images, not a lot of heavy loading. It's highly optimized up front. On the top, you see Google Fonts, uh, a timeline. And on the bottom, you see the same thing with subfont applied. And you can see it cuts away three point something seconds of my time to meaningful paint. That is a big deal. And I'm not the only one that's impressed about that. Carl Matthews of Gatsby.js, uh, which is a static site generator uh, based on uh, using React, uh, he has been into performance a lot. The output of Gatsby is highly, highly performant for the first load. He was able to cut off half a second of the page load of Gatsby.js.com, which is an output of his own tool. So he's happy about that, which means that uh, it can do something. Subfont works extremely well for static pages. Luckily, static pages are becoming all the rage these days. The Jamstack, uh, Jekyll, Hugo, Gatsby, or any other of the static site generators actually enable you to use toolings like the above. And hosting is extremely simple with these static pages. Now, if you're not in a situation where you can actually generate a static page and run this tool, you're in luck because you can just refer to this slide deck and you can apply all the techniques that I just showed you. I would recommend stopping after preload because the rest is, uh, it's too hairy for dynamic pages, to be honest. So what I'm hoping that tools like these can, can supply is an ability to have workflows where you're doing your workflow can just add the things that you need and not think about the performance aspect. And that's if you know about it. It's also OK not to know about all of these de details. I think nobody should know all of the details that goes in, into this tool, but you should still be able to have a performant website. Performance is for everyone, and performance is helping everyone in emerging markets or accessing the services that they're using every day. So I really hope that not only this tool can help you create such a workflow, I also hope it can create a situation where you can say yes to a designer when they say, we need 100 web fonts. Maybe not 100, maybe four. Um, instead of saying no, uh, I like saying yes. I like saying yes and instead of saying no. So if you want to hear more about toolings like these, uh, this is uh, only one of many tools I built uh, on, this, uh, on this ideology. You can follow me on Twitter. I swear, when I got this nickname 26 years ago, I did not know what it, what it means in, in this country. <laughs> In Denmark, it means happy. Um, <laughs> you can find Subfont here on, on NPM. I hope you try it, and please give me feedback. It's supposed to also be a nice user experience to use the command line tool, so I'd really appreciate feedback if it's not. So um, that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening.